This is section 12.1, part B, estimating the parameters. When the conditions are met, we can do inference about the regression model, mu sub y is equal to alpha plus beta x. The first step is to estimate the unknown parameters. If we calculate the least squares regression line of y hat is equal to a plus bx, the slope b is an unbiased estimator of the true slope beta, and the y-intercept a is an unbiased estimator of the true y-intercept alpha. The remaining parameters is the standard deviation sigma, which describes the variability of the res response y about the population regression line. The least squares regression line compute, computed from the sample data estimates the population regression line. So the residuals estimate how much y varies about the population line. Because sigma is the standard deviation of responses about the population regression line, we estimate it by the standard deviation of the residuals. And remember, we covered this S value in chapter three. It tells us the typical predicted error. And to find this S value, we can do the square root of the sum of the residual squared divided by n minus two, or we can do this as a square root of the sum of the y sub i's minus y hat sub i's squared all over n minus 2. So computer output for the least squares regression analysis of the helicopter data is shown below. The least squares regression line for the data gives us that our predicted flight time is equal to negative 0 0.03761 plus 0 0.0057244 times the drop height. Now remember, if you are going to write this as just y hat equals and then you put your equation and then you just put x at the end, you will have to define what those variables are. The slope beta of the true regression line says how much the flight, average flight time of the paper helicopter increases when the drop height increases by one centimeter. Because b is 0 0.0057244, and this estimates the unknown value of beta, we estimate on, that on average, flight times increase by about 0.0057244 seconds for each additional centimeter of drop time. We need to the y-intercept, or the a value, which is negative 0.03761, to draw the line to make predictions. But it has no statistical meaning in this example. There is no helicopter that was dropped at less than 150 centimeters, so we don't have any data anywhere near the value of x equals zero. We might expect that the actual y intercepts alpha of the true regression line to be zero because if you're not dropping the helicopter, there should be no drop time. The y intercept of our sample regression line is negative 0.03761, and that is pretty close to the value of zero. Our estimate for the standard deviation sigma of flight times about the true regression line at each x value is s equals 0.168 seconds. This is also the size of the typical predicted error if we use the least squares regression line to predict the flight time of helicopters from its drop height. So our s value tells us on average, we expect an error for our predictions of about 0.168 seconds. It is possible to infer about any of the three parameters in the regression model, alpha, beta, or sigma. However, the slope beta of the population regression line is usually the most important parameter in a regression problem, so we'll restrict our attention to inference about the slope. Let's return to our earlier exploration of old faithful eruptions. For all 222 eruptions in the single month, the population regression line for predicting the interval of time until the next eruption, y, from the duration of the previous eruption, x, was given to us by mu sub y is equal to 33.97 plus 10.36x. The standard deviation of the responses for this line is given by the sigma equal to 6.159. The figure below shows the approximate sampling distribution of B that we generated before. If we take all possible simple random samples of size 20 eruptions from the population, we get that the actual sampling distribution of B. Can we guess its shape, center, and spread? The shape would be normal. The center 
we would assume that the average of all our B values would just equal beta, which is the true slope of the population, which in this case is 10.36. To find the spread, we would do the standard deviation of the slopes, and that's just going to equal the standard deviation of the population divided by the standard deviation for the sample times the square root of n minus 1, or in this case, we would get 1.30. If you remember, we did a simulation earlier and we estimated this value to be 1.31, which is very close to what the actual value is. In practice, we don't know sigma for the population regression line, so we estimate it with a standard deviation of the residuals S. Then we estimate the spread of the sampling distribution of B with a standard error of the slope. So if we see SE sub B, that is the standard error of the slope. And to find that, we would just do S over the standard deviation of the sample times the square root of N minus 1. The slope beta of the population regression line, mu sub y is equal to alpha plus beta x, is the rate of change of the mean response as the explanatory variable increases. We often want to estimate beta. The slope B of the sample regression line is our point estimate of beta. A confidence interval is more useful than the point estimate because it shows how precise the estimate B is likely to be. The confidence interval for beta has a familiar form. So for our confidence intervals, we're still going to do the statistic plus or minus our critical value times the standard deviation of the statistic. For this case, to find our confidence interval, we're just going to do B plus or minus T star times our S of E sub B. We're going to call this the t interval for the slope. So when we need to find the t interval for the slope, we are going to say b plus or minus t star times se sub b, where, remember, se sub b is the standard error of the slope, and we can find that by doing s over the standard deviation of the sample times the square root of n minus 1. To find that critical value t star, we are going to use our degrees of freedom is going to equal n minus 2. Although we give the formula for standard error of b, we rarely are going to actually have to calculate this by hand. The computer outputs usually are going to give you that standard error or the se sub b along with the b value itself. However you get it, your SE sub B estimates how much the slope of the sample regression line typically varies from the slope of the population regression line, if we repeated this data production process many times. So if we take a look at an example, we're still talking about the helicopter drop heights and the time that they are in flight, but now we have Minitab output that gives us our information for our least squares regression line. So recall that the data came from dropping 75 paper helicopters from various heights and measuring the flight times. Some computer output from this regression is shown below. We checked conditions for performing the inference earlier, so we can go ahead and do our calculations. We need to identify the standard error of the slope, SE sub B, from the computer output, and we need to interpret this value in context. So if we look, we are looking at the slope. So the slope is not the constant. It's going to be talking about how much it changes based on the drop height. And so if we're looking for the SE sub B, we're going to look for the SE sub slope, and the slope is here. So our standard error of the slope, or our SE sub B, would be 0 0.0002018. And if we interpret this in context, we got the value of our standard error of our slope, our SE sub B, from that column. If we repeated the random assignment many times, the slope of the sample regression line would typically vary by about 0 0.0002 from the slope of the true regression line for predicting the flight time from the drop height. Find the cr critical value for the 95% confidence interval for the slope of the true regression line. Then calculate the confidence interval and show your work. So we are going to have to find that confident, our critical value or our T star. So to do that, we're first going to find your degrees of freedom. And remember, your degrees of freedom is going to be N minus 2. 
Now we know that there are 70 drop heights, so our degrees of freedom will be 68. If you look at your T table or table B, 68 is not a degrees of freedom that is on that table, so we're going to have to use our degrees of freedom of 60. And if we use degrees of freedom of 60, that is going to give us, you're going to go to degrees of freedom of 60, go across until you find the 95th percentile, and that's going to give us a T star value of 2.000. Now, based on this, we need to find our confidence interval. So we're going to do B plus or minus T star times our SE sub B. Now, we know that our slope in this case, we're talking about the drop height, and its coefficient for the slope will be 0 0.00057244 plus or minus our T star value times our SE sub B. And if we do those calculations, if you add and subtract to get those values, we're going to get that our interval goes from 0.0053208 to 0 0.0061280. Interpret the interval from part B in context. So we, have, we say that our 95% confidence interval is from 0 0.00538, 53208 to 0 0.0061280. This means that we are 95% confident that the interval from the first part to the second part, seconds per centimeter, captures the slope of the true regression line relating the flight time y and the drop height x of the paper helicopters. Explain the meaning of 95% confidence in context. So what the 95% means is if we repeat the experiment many, many times and use the method that we did in part A to construct a confidence interval each time, about 95% of those resulting intervals will capture the slope of the true regression line relating flight time Y and drop height X of the paper helicopters. The value of t given in the computer regression output are not the critical value for a confidence interval. They come from carrying out a significance test about the y-intercept or slope of the population regression line. You can find a confidence interval for the y-intercept alpha of the population regression line in the same way as using alpha and se sub a. So from this one, you would find it in the constant row of the Minitab output. However, we are usually interested only in the point estimate of alpha that is provided by the computer output itself. So in chapter three, we examined data from a study that investigated why some people don't gain weight even when they overeat. Perhaps fidgeting and other non-exercise activities explains why. Some people may spontaneously increase their non-exercise activities when fed more. Researchers deliberately overfed a random sample of 16 healthy young adults for 18 weeks. They measured fat gain in kilograms and change in energy use in calories from activity other than deliberate exercise, such as fidgeting, daily living, and anything like that for each subject. And here was the data that we found. So from this data, we need to construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the slope of the population regression line. So first, let's figure out what our slope is. So it's not our constant. We are talking about the NEA change. And we know that our slope for our sample is going to be negative 0 0.0034415. We know that our SE sub B or our standard error of our slope is going to be 0.0007414. We know that they sampled 16 subjects. So to find our degrees of freedom, remember we will do N minus 2. But to solve this problem, we are going to do a four-step process. So the first thing we're going to do is write our state. We want to estimate the slope beta of the population regression line relating non-exercise activity 
to fat gain at a 90% confidence level. Next, you need to come up with your plan. In your plan, you need to tell us what method you're gonna use, and then you need to check your conditions. So we will use a T interval for the slope to est estimate beta if the conditions are met. Now these conditions are different than what we've been doing in the other chapters. The first thing we need to do is check to make sure it's linear. So if we look at our scatter plots, the scatter plot shows a clear linear pattern. Also, if we look at our residual plot, which is the second graph, we see a nice scatter around the residual line of residual equals zero. Next, we need to check for independence. So we can still check that 10% condition. Because the researchers sampled without replacement, there needs to be at least 150 healthy young people or young adults in the population of interest, and we can assume that is true. To check normal, because our sample size is less than 30, we will have to graph the information. Now remember, if our sample size would have been 30 or larger, we can assume normality. But if we look at the histogram on the right, it is roughly symmetric and single peaked, so we have no obvious departures from normality. We also need to check equal variance. So it's hard to tell from so few points whether the scatter plot or, um, of points around the residual line zero is about the same for all the x values, but we're going to go ahead and let us continue. And then random, these subjects were randomly selected. So with no obvious violations of any of our conditions, we should be safe to do our inference about the regression line. So next you're gonna do your calculations. Now remember, we found our value for B because it was the coefficient for the slope. We also found our SE sub B or our standard error of the slope because we have our SE of the coefficient and we use the one for the slope. We know our degrees of freedom is going to be n minus 2, which in this case will give us 14. So if we go to table B, we look at degrees of freedom for 14, and we go across until we find the 90% confidence interval, we will find a T star value of 1.761. So to find our confidence interval, we are going to use the equation of B plus or minus T star times SE sub B. We know our B value, we just found our T star value, and we know our S E sub B. So if we plug that all in, remember when you get your plus or minus, subtract first, and then add second, and we're going to get our interval. The last thing you're going to have to do is to make your conclusion. So we are 90% confident that the interval from negative 0.00474 to negative 0.002136 kilograms captures the actual slope of the population regression line relating the non-exercise activity change to fat gain for healthy young adults. The predicted change in the average fat gain is quite small for one calorie increase in NEA. What, is NEA increase, what if the NEA increased was by 100 calories? We could just multiply both endpoints of our confidence interval in the example by 100 to get a 90% confidence interval for the corresponding predicted change in the average fat gain. The resulting interval would be negative 0.4747 and negative 0.2136. That is, the population regression line predicts a decrease in the average fat gain of between 0.4747 and 0.2136 kilograms for each additional 100 calories increased in NEA. So let's check our understanding. In chapter three, we examine data on the body weights and backpack weights of a group of eight randomly selected ninth grade students at Webb School. So mini-tab output from a least squares regression analysis for this data is given below. What conditions must be met for regression inference to be appropriate? Remember, we need to check linear, independent, normal, equal variance, and random. So if we check these values, first one is linear. The scatter plot must show a linear pattern. Next, we need to check for independence. So the observations must be independent. Next is normal. So the residuals need to be approximately normally distributed. We need to check for equal variance. 
which means the residuals must show roughly equal scatter for all the x values. And then lastly, you need to check that it's random, so the observations must be produced by random sampling or a randomized experiment. With such small sample size, it is difficult to check several of the conditions for regression inference. Assume that the conditions are met. Construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the slope of the population regression line. Now remember, to do this, you need to know your B value. And in this case, we're talking about body weight. We're looking for the coefficient. So our B value will be 0 0.09080. We're also gonna need our standard error of our slope. So if we do our SE coefficients, we're still in body weight. We know this value will be 0 0.02831. We need to find our degrees of freedom. And it says that we have eight randomly selected students. Remember, degrees of freedom is N minus two. So we'll do eight minus two, which gives us six. And then we're doing a 95% confidence interval so to find that T star, we'll go to the line for degrees of freedom of six. We'll go across the 95th percentile or 95th confidence level, and we will get a T star value of 2.447. So to find that confidence interval, remember we're gonna do B plus or minus T star times the standard error of the slope. And if we plug in the values that we have, We'll end up with an interval from 0 0.02153 to 0 0.16070007. So we are 95% confident that the interval from 0 0.02153 to 0 0.16007 captures the true slope of the population regression line relating backpack weight Y and body weight X among ninth grade students at the Webb's school.